In this concluding message, we highlight what our covenant provisions, privileges, and blessings are, and outline important steps to receiving covenant blessings. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the blood covenant, and uh, honestly, uh, you know, we have just been giving uh, some of the essence, the uh, the key highlights, the key points uh, of this whole teaching on blood covenants that we find in in scripture. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, in the not, not too distant future, we can release a, uh, release a complete b- book um, that talks about the covenants, the cross and the blood. These three go together. So uh, we are actually putting together this book on the covenants, the cross and the blood. Uh, they all go together. They all connected. And uh, 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 we need to understand each, each aspect uh, to get a, a full understanding of the subject on the covenants, uh, the cross of Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus. Uh, it, it is, it's a wonderful thing. And uh, I'm looking forward, I look forward to uh, releasing that out uh, uh, as a free resource soon. Now, uh, we're just giving you highlights of, of, of these things. And uh, uh, we have covered uh, in the last few services on um, uh, what is the meaning, uh, what is a blood covenant, what is a covenant, uh, what is the purpose of a covenant and how God establishes a covenant. We did that in uh, the first part of this series. And um, we, you know, one of the important things we said was that the purpose of a covenant, uh, of the blood covenant especially, is for a, a loving, intimate relationship. That's why God establishes a covenant. And everything about that relationship is wrapped, uh, is a uh, encapsulated, if you will, uh, by this blood covenant. It is undergirded, it is covered. Uh, uh, it is, it is uh, completely protected by the blood covenant. Everything that goes into that relationship. So when God says, you are my son, you are my daughter, that is a blood covenant relationship. That relationship is covered by his blood covenant. When he says, you are an heir and you're a joint heir with Jesus, that relationship is covered by this blood covenant. And so the purpose of the blood covenant is to bring us into this intimate, loving relationship with God, a a relationship where you and I are so secure. And yet we know that God, uh, expects us to respect that covenant and walk very honorably of that covenant. Uh, in part two, we talked about the new covenant that Jesus established with his own body and blood. There could be no greater blood covenant than this, that God would offer his own body and his own blood to establish this covenant, to put it in place and uh, set it there for us and then invite us in to come into that covenant. In part three, Uh, Last Sunday, uh, we talked about the fact that uh, today uh, Jesus uh, exalted uh, in his uh, glorified stay. Uh, He, of course, he is king, he is Lord, uh, many things that we could talk about. But in relation to the covenant, we highlighted two important aspects that Jesus is the, the high priest of the covenant. And Jesus is also the mediator, the guarantor, the surety or the enforcer of this covenant which he has established. The Bible calls it the everlasting covenant. So really, you know, God planned this covenant even before eternity. And, uh, you know, we've talked about that in some earlier uh, messages where even before God created, he set certain things in place. Uh, that Jesus was the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. That means even before Adam and Eve were created, the Lamb of God was there, uh, the work was already done in the mind of God. So also this covenant that we are talking about, uh, Hebrews calls it uh, the everlasting covenant, the eternal covenant, because it was there in the mind of God, even before things happened in the natural, in time and space as we know it. So we are part of this eternal covenant uh, that has been put in place by the blood of the Lamb of God, of Jesus Christ. Uh, Now, in this closing a message in the series on the blood covenant, we want to focus in on how you and I as, as believers can receive uh, the provisions, uh, the blessings uh, that God wants us to receive uh, in this, uh, through his covenant. So that, that is one of the aspects of covenant that, that the lesser uh, is blessed by the greater. Uh, when uh, Abraham met uh, Melchizedek, he blessed him. He was a high priest. He blessed him. Uh, now, we are, are recipients of God's covenant, and God has made provision for us 
to receive. And so I want to talk about that. I want to try to put it together. I'll put this message together in a very concise way, uh, as, as clearly as possible, uh, so that you and I can be encouraged to receive covenant blessings. You know, it is so sad, and it's something that uh, I, I think about a lot. And so why are God's people living so far below uh, the blessings, the provisions, and the privileges that God has actually made available for us? Now, we are all good people. Uh, we are all sincere people. We really love the Lord. Uh, but somehow, uh, our life doesn't, uh, uh, is not reflecting who our God is. Our God is Jehovah Rapha. Why are God's people falling sick and dying? Our God is Jehovah Nisi, the Lord who gives us victory. But why are God's people still defeated in one or more areas of their lives? Our God is Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Uh, but then why are God's people struggling? Uh, and so on. So uh, you know, that is a burden. That's something that we're trying to answer and trying to get a uh, an understanding on why are we as God's people living far below uh, what the Bible says we can live at. And, you know, the wrong thing to do in this, in, in such a scenario uh, is to, uh, is to, is to change our theology to accommodate our experience. That's what we should not do. Don't change your theology. Your theology is always based on the Word of God. Change your experience to match your theology. That means you say, God, this is what your Word says. I want to lift the level of my experience to match your Word. Don't try to change His Word and filter it down and twist it around and change your theology to you know, explain away your uh, lack of of expression and experience of who God really is. No, never do that. God is Jehovah Rapha. He's the healer always. So what we have to do is, God, how do I change my experience? How do I lift my experience? Where am I missing it? So that I lift my experience up to the level of the promise of your word, to the level of, of what Jesus said I can have. How do I lift this up to match that? There's always this gap that we are seeing. Uh, we have to accept it. And then we have to talk to God and say, God, show us how to bridge the gap. Show us how to rise up so that we can, don't have to change who God is. We don't have to change what his word says, but lift our experience up to the level of his word. And that's what we are trying to do here in this message today. So much of the things I will talk to you about, we will hear from the word of God, will challenge us to say, God, work in me. Lift the level of my experience up to match your word. Now, don't try to say, don't try to, you know, uh, Explain away his word and your lack of experiencing his word. Don't do that. Lift your experience up to the level of his word. So as we talk about receiving new covenant blessings, covenant blessings, you know, first of all, we need to understand what does our covenant, what are our covenant privileges, provisions, and blessings? You know, and we, we do this all the time. You know, suppose you sign up for a tour package or you sign up for you know uh, uh, some 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 uh, engagement uh, you know you want to know what what is included in that package of course you've paid some money but you know does that tour package include hotel stays all your flights are covered uh, all your meals are covered all the local transportation is covered you want to know that it'll be so sad after you sign up for the package and you pay for it all uh, and because just because of you don't know that you know your meals are covered you go and start buying your own meals. It's a waste of your time and a waste of your money. Or you sit down in the room saying, hmm, I have nothing to eat. Uh, that is foolish because your tour package includes all of that. So you can go, go to the buffet, enjoy your meal, um, enjoy your local transportation, whatever. You need to know what your package includes. And so also, if it be, you know, that's just a small example. But the point is this, that we must know what our covenant that with God, the covenant that God has given to us, what is what are the provisions He has made as part of that covenant? What are the privileges that He has given to us and say, take it, this is part of my covenant with you? What are the blessings that He uh, uh, gives to us? Remember, it's all by grace, meaning this covenant that we're talking about is a covenant of grace. It is not something God is giving to us because you know you deserve it, you've earned it. No. It's a covenant of grace. So God is saying, I'm giving this to you uh, because of my loving kindness towards you. But we need to know that. That's very important. Now, uh, as we said in the very beginning, in part one of this 
uh, message. The, there are two cornerstones of God's covenant. One, it is his nature, and second is his word. These are cornerstones of God's covenant. So if we want to understand uh, our privileges, our provision, the provisions and the blessings that God extends to us, we just have to look at the very nature of God and his word. What did he say in his word? Uh, that he's making available to us. And so I just want to quickly go through that aspect. So help us understand what really has been made available to us. And then uh, in the latter part of this message, talk about how do we appropriate, how do we receive uh, these covenant blessings? So let me talk about the nature of God. Uh, you know, God made a simple statement to Abraham. He said, you know, Abraham, and he made this Abrahamic covenant. He said, I will bless you. Now, you know, in, in, in that statement, God never said, I will heal you, I will provide for you, I will protect you. He did not give those minor details. He simply said, I will bless you. Or he said, I am El Shaddai. I am the Lord God Almighty, who was more than enough, who was more than sufficient. That's all. So I'm El Shaddai, you walk before me, uh, be perfect. So uh, when God said, I will bless you, he didn't actually have to spell out all the details. It's simply saying, all that I am, I'm making available to you through my covenant. On the other end of the covenant, the one, the covenant maker is El Shaddai. He's more than enough. He is God and all who he is, he's making available to the covenant. And here, here's, here's, this, this uh, wonderful example, illustration of this that we see in scripture. You see, God never told Abraham specifically, I am your healer. But in Luke the, 10, uh, Luke the 13th chapter, uh, when Jesus is ministering to this woman in the synagogue, uh, she's had this back problem for 18 years. You know what Jesus tells? He says, um, this woman who's been a daughter, who's, who is a daughter of Abraham, she deserves to be healed. She has to be healed. Satan is bound there, but she's a daughter of Abraham. Now, did God tell Abraham, I will heal you? No, he just said, I will bless you. But in saying, I will bless you, he meant everything I am, I'm giving to you. And here Jesus is saying, she's a daughter of Abraham. She has a right. She has a provision for her healing. She has a privilege or a blessing, whatever word you want to use. Healing is hers because the God who told Abraham, I will bless you and said, I will keep that for you. I will keep the covenant with all your children. This woman is a daughter of Abraham. Healing is hers. So you see, all the God ever spelt it out to Abraham when he said, I will bless you. It meant all that he is, is being made available to uh, uh, to. To his people. So that's why these covenant names of God are important. We mentioned this um, in our very first message when God said, I am Yahweh. Yahweh is the eternal, self-existent, immutable, unchangeable God who keeps covenant. That's Yahweh, the God of covenant, the eternal God who keeps covenant, Yahweh. And he revealed himself through his covenant name. So all of these covenant names are an expression of an aspect of the nature of God. He is Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rohi, uh, so many of these covenant names. And I think there are about 52 of these covenant names. Uh, and, and all of this is really being made available to us through the covenant. So can you imagine and God says, you come into my covenant through my son, Jesus Christ. You are entering into a covenant with Almighty God. And all who God is has been made available to you through that blood covenant. That's the nature of God. The nature of God is a cornerstone of this covenant. And you and I must believe Jehovah Rapha is for me. Jehovah Jireh is mine. He is for me through this covenant. All who he is is made available through this covenant. The second aspect of us understanding uh, what provision God has made, what privileges and blessings He's made available to us uh, through the blood covenant is to know the word of God. And if you study the word of God, uh, and I'm going to, of course, talk about the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and then the new covenant, and just look at scripture on these things. Now, 
in, in uh, what does the scripture say of, uh, about the new covenant in relation to the Abrahamic covenant? Now, this is what the word of God says. Remember, this is the second cornerstone of God's covenant, the word of God. And so we're going to look at what does the word of God tell me uh, about the provisions, the privileges, and the blessings that God has made available to you and me in, his, for, in the blood covenant. Abrahamic covenant, what did God say in Galatians 3, 13 and 14 and verse 29? The scripture says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And verse 29, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what is the scripture saying here? It's saying here that if you and I belong to Jesus, the blessing of Abraham passes on to us. Now, of course, uh, we are Gentiles. We are not natural descendants of Abraham. But he says, because we belong to Jesus, we inherit, we receive the blessings that God had given to Abraham. Now, if you look at scripture uh, and you say, now, what did Abraham receive as a blessing because of his uh, covenant with God? What did God do in his life? Of course, immediately people would say, well, the, first, the blessing he received was the blessed gift of righteousness. God imputed righteousness to him. And that is true. But that was not the only thing God did. You look at the whole package, look at everything else that God bestowed on Abraham because Abraham was in covenant with him. And that's what we should understand. That's what we should take because the Bible says we are Abraham's descendants and we inherit the promise. Just like Isaac inherited, we inherit, but we do it through Christ spiritually. So uh, if, you, if you study the scripture, and I'm just summarizing this for us, we see that God blessed Abraham in all things. You know, in Genesis 24, Abraham's servant says, you know, my, the Lord has blessed my master greatly and he has blessed him in everything. Every area of his life was blessed. Secondly, we see that God blessed Abraham so that he could become a blessing. He would be a channel of blessing to others. We see that, uh, as we mentioned, righteousness was given to Abraham because of faith. Abraham had friendship with God, which we said is the purpose of of covenant relationship. It's that loving intimacy with God. And Abraham entered into that. God called him a friend in James 2, 23. Abraham had victory over his enemies. Uh, so when he had to uh, battle, he experienced victory. God was with, gave him victory. Uh, Abraham had blessings on him and his family, his descendants. God said, I will bless your descendants after you in their generation. So this was part of Abraham's, God's covenant to Abraham. And the Bible is saying, you know, if you are Christ, you inherit these things. So we need to open our minds and say, okay, this is what God has made available. If God did this for Abraham, Abraham was a man of faith. I am walking by faith. I inherit these things according to the word of God. We are not violating the word. We're just embracing what God has put in his word. Now, when you look at the Mosaic Covenant, and, and again, we said that God had established a blood covenant with his people through, the, through Moses, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, that, that was a blood covenant that God had put in place. Now, even you look at the Mosaic Covenant, God, of course, gave them a lot of commandments and instructions. But even that covenant came with blessings. Deuteronomy 28 uh, verses 1 through 14, talk about all of these blessings. And uh, it's an extended passage that you could read. And basically God is saying, you'll be blessed coming in. You'll be blessed going out. The blessings of God will overtake you. The Lord will bless you in all the work of your hands. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. Your basket, your store will be blessed. The heavens above you will be blessed to give you rain in your land in its season. And God says, you will, you'll be so blessed. You will lend it to many others. Uh, you, will, you will not have to borrow. Uh, he will make you the head. He'll put you above only. And all of these blessings will come upon you. This was the Mosaic Covenant. Now, in light of the Mosaic Covenant, what is the New Covenant state? Now, we must understand the Bible is saying very clearly, for example, in Hebrews 7 and verse 22, it says, By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. So Jesus is a surety. We talked about this last Sunday. He's a surety. He's a mediator. He's a guarantor of what? Of a better 
covenant. So the new covenant that Jesus brings to us, the eternal everlasting covenant through his own blood and his own body offered for us, Jesus is the surety of a better covenant. This covenant is better. So that means if all these blessings were promised under the old covenant, which has been done away with, then I must look at the old covenant and say, hey, that's got to be my minimum because I, you and I are in a better covenant. Same thing in Hebrews 8 and verse 6, the scripture says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. So this covenant that Jesus gives to us, the Bible is saying it's a better covenant. It has better promises. So, uh, you know, it is only right for us. Look at the Mosaic Covenant, the Old Covenant. Look at all the things God promised them, uh, victory over their enemies. He said, you know, the enemy will come before you one way. They'll flee before you seven ways. Um, victory in their lives and uh, health and blessing and, and all of that. And, 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 and you, you'll be my own peculiar people and you will have my word and you'll, you love the Lord your God. You have a wonderful relationship with God. All of that was given in the Old Covenant. Now we are in a better covenant. Say, God... I've got to have better than that. And, you know, I, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, you, you and I take those promises and therefore we all say, you know, we're going to have, all have mansions and we're all going to have many cars and do all of that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying for each one of us in our lives, these promises are relevant. You know, if you are a, uh, uh, if you're a farmer somewhere, for you, that covenant comes into force to bless you in what you do in your farming, in whatever you're doing. If you're a businessman, you're running a small business somewhere, for you that covenant comes into force to bless you right there in your home, your family, uh, your, your business, so that you can be a blessing. Now, some of you may be people in big places of influence. You may be CEOs, and you may be presidents and vice presidents of large corporations. Well, this covenant comes into force right there. So in that place, God will bless you. God will cause you to do well. And God will cause your family to be blessed. And through that, uh, you can reveal it. So this covenant is re relevant to each of us, uh, right where we are, whatever vocation, whatever place, whatever stage, whatever standing we have in life, the covenant comes into effect. And, and all these blessings are things that all of us can take a hold of and say, God, this is part of the covenant. I want to receive it. You know, when you come into the new covenant, the Bible is explicitly telling us uh, uh, that in the new covenant, you and I are blessed. We, uh, Ephesians 1, and verse 3, it says, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So every spiritual blessing. And now when we think, say, use the word spiritual blessing, don't think about just things that are no, not relevant to the natural world. Now, every spiritual blessing means every blessing that comes from God who is spirit. God is spirit. So every blessing that comes from God is spiritual. And he is the healer. He's a provider. He's a deliverer. He's a miracle worker. He's a door opener. He's a mountain mover. Yeah, he's the you know, wilderness changer. Every blessing that comes from God who is spirit is a spiritual blessing. So everything that flows from God is available to you in Christ. God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing is what the scripture is saying. Again, I want us to understand that everything that comes from God that is spoken of by his nature, that is spoken to us in his word is available to you and me as believers. One more important thing I want to highlight before we go and talk about how to receive this. I want us to understand that as as New Covenant believers, each one of us has access to all of these blessings. The Bible tells us here in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He says, give thanks to God because he has qualified us. He has made us fit. He has made us competent to partake, to share in the inheritance uh, that he offers to his saints, his people who, who are in the light. That was whoever you are as a saint, as a believer of God in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been already qualified. That means, you know, uh, there is no pre-qualification necessary. You've gone past that. You are qualified. Uh, to, it is waiting for you to come and take it. In other words, you know, uh, you, you've already gone through the pre-qualification process. And God is saying you are qualified to partake, to receive 
the inheritance that has been made available to each one of his people who belong to his kingdom. So you as a believer, you have every quote unquote right, uh, you are ready to partake of the blessings. So now how do we receive our covenant blessings? Having understood that our covenant blessings entails everything God is offering to his people, how do we receive? I want us to look at three important keys or just simple things. Uh, I want to make this as simple as possible. Number three important things are receiving covenant blessings. Number one is obedience to his word. Number two, we need to exercise faith. And number three, we need to take it by force. And I'm going to cover these things as quickly as I can. Number one is we must be obedient to God's word. And we see all of these three things portrayed or embodied in, 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 in Abraham as a man who walked in blood covenant with God. And the reason I point to Abraham is because the Bible talks to us in the new covenant. It says, follow the faith of that man, Abraham, so we can connect uh, Abraham and to our walk of faith. So Abraham did all of these three things. He walked in obedience to God. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, uh, and then again in verse 11, it says, you know, when Abraham was called, he obeyed God. He went out. He followed God. Um, and when he was asked by God to offer Isaac, uh, he offered. He obeyed God. So Abraham obeyed God. Secondly, Abraham walked by faith. That's why Romans chapter 4 tells us, you know, that we have to walk in the steps of the faith of Abraham uh, in Romans chapter 4 and uh, verse 12. And a walk in the steps of the faith. And Romans 4, 17, 21 tells us about the faith of Abraham. And Abraham also took it by force. Hebrews 6 and verse 12 says, you know, you got we got to be like Abraham, who through faith and patience inherited the promise. So, you know, he, he didn't take it lightly, even though he had to wait 25 years to see the promise fulfilled. Uh, now, I'm not saying it will take 25 years in your life and mine. We're just looking at Abraham's example. Uh, but he held on to the promise of God and he was able to see it fulfilled. So, number one, obedience to God's word. We must uh, know the word of God and we must live by the word of God. If you want to receive the covenant provisions, blessings and privileges over your life, walk in the light of God's word. Acts 20 and verse 32, uh, the apostle Paul tells the leaders in Ephesians, he says, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified by faith. You see, why is the word of God important? The word of God's grace so important because it is that word that builds us up, that matures us so that we can walk in our inheritance. You see, uh, many people like to be inspired with, by the word, but look, uh, thank God for uh, messages that inspire us, but we need messages that build us up. We need messages that disciple us, that mature us, that cause us to grow and stretch and build. Because when we grow, to that we are built up by the word, then we can walk in our inheritance. Mm -hmm. And that's what we are trying to do as we bring the word of God to you. So know the word. The apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian believers in Ephesians 1 and verse 18. He says, I want the eyes of your understanding to be enlightened so that you will know the riches of the inheritance that belongs to you. We must know the word. We must walk in the word, obey the word, align yourself to the word of God. This is where the Holy Spirit works. He causes us to obey the word of God. He gives us the strength, uh, the, uh, the, the, the equipping, the empowering we need to obey God's word. Number two, we must exercise faith. You know, every promise of God is received by faith. Abraham walked by faith into the promise of God. When Jesus ministered to people in the old covenant, he responded to people who came to him in faith. They saw him, they reached out to him, and he responded to their faith. They received by faith. Even people outside the covenant, like the Roman centurion or the woman from Canaan, came and received by faith. So you and I must learn the dynamic of how to exercise faith in God. You see, the wrong... Uh, position many of us take as, oh, I believed in Jesus, so I have faith. I know how to use faith. No, that's not true. Of course you believed in Jesus. Of course you have to measure of faith. But now you've got to learn how to walk by faith. You've got to learn how to exercise that faith in God. So the scriptures teach us. In fact, the Lord Jesus taught us about the dynamics of faith and how to exercise faith in God. And a very important passage that, that really captures for us very nicely, uh, you know, how to have faith in God, of course, is Mark chapter 11, uh, verses 22, 23, and 24, where Jesus gave a very succinct 
teaching on faith. In Mark 11, 22, he says, have faith in God. And then he says in verse 23, uh, Verily I say to you, whosoever therefore shall say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. And then verse 24, he says, uh, you know, whatever you desire when you pray, believe that you have received them and you will have them. So Jesus taught us about faith. You know, what must we do? Have faith in God, then speak. Speak your words of faith. Speak to your circumstance. Speak to your situation. Speak to your mountain. And third, believe that you have received. When you pray, believe that you have received. Now, if you and I, will exercise, will we'll take the word of God and, and exercise faith in the word in relation to our situations, we will begin to possess, we will begin to receive the provisions and the blessings of our blood covenant. So how does that work? So for instance, you know, take the covenant of healing. God said, you know, I am the Lord your healer. Now let's say you and I, maybe if you are fighting some disease in our body, we got to exercise faith to receive that blessing. Uh, you, you have to have faith in God, that God is your healer. Healing has been provided for you through the uh, cross of Jesus. It's part of God's covenant to you. You are a son and daughter of God. Healing is yours. Now exercise faith in that. You begin to speak those words of faith towards that sickness. What is that mountain? In this case, it's sickness. You begin to speak to it. You tell the mountain, sickness, disease, you have no place in my body because by the stripes of Jesus, I have been healed. You're exercising your faith in God and His provision, His word against that mountain. So you've got to speak there and then believe that you have received. So that means we believe that we have received. Even Jesus didn't say believe that you might receive. He didn't say believe that you'll receive it if it is the will of God. Uh, he didn't say believe that you will receive it when the time is right. He didn't say that. He said when you pray, Believe that you have received. Again, this is where many of us miss it. We are well-meaning believers, we're sincere people, but we don't practice Mark 11, 24. We always come out of prayer saying, well, we will get it if God wants us to have it. That's wrong to say that. Uh, or sometimes we say, well, it will come in God's time. It's wrong to say that. Why? Because Jesus said, when you pray, believe that you have received it. When you know it's part of your provision and God has already said it's there in the covenant, then it's wrong for you and me to say, well, we will get it if God wants us to have it. It's wrong to make that statement because God already said it's part of the covenant. He wants us to believe that we have received it. So we say, God, I thank you. It's part of my covenant. I am declaring my body healed. It's done now. It's done in the spirit. I'm calling it done. It's not a matter of I may get it, I might get it. Uh, it will happen if it's God's will. Those are non-issues. They are not even in the picture. They, are, they don't belong to the covenant. They're not covenant talk. Covenant talk is I believe I've received because my God has covenanted it to me. It's mine. We practice Mark 11, 24. And now, of course, you know, you, you walk with wisdom. You do what you have to do. But that's your faith. Your faith is at work in you. And your faith will produce. According to your faith, it will be done. Faith is so important for us to receive our covenant provisions, blessings, and privileges. But we must understand how to exercise faith in God. Don't assume that you know how to exercise faith in God. Go to the scriptures. Learn from the scriptures. How am I supposed to exercise faith in God? Go to people who know how to walk by faith and they will teach you how to walk by faith. And then you begin to practice it in your life. And so that's how I must walk by faith. And so that is very important. And the third thing is this, you must take it by force. You know, Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, Jesus said, from the days of John the Baptist, until now, that means it's continuing even now. The kingdom of God is having is experiencing violence, and the violent take it by force. So from the time of John the Baptist, dynamics had changed. God's kingdom became available through the covenant. Here, everything that's in God's kingdom is yours now. Come in, take it. But Jesus said, the violent take it by force. Those who are spiritually aggressive, those who are spiritually tenacious. They are the ones who take what is in the kingdom. Now, why is that? It is not because God is keeping us out of the kingdom. It's not because of that. It is because there is the flesh and the devil that are trying to keep us out of the kingdom. And it's the people who are able to contend and push past what the flesh 
our own flesh is doing and what the devil is doing, they are the ones who are going to experience the kingdom. So, you know, if you and I want to experience the kingdom, this it applies. We've got to take it by force. And as we mentioned in our sermon last Sunday, there is Satan who is trying to keep us out from experiencing covenant provisions, privileges, and blessings. Even in the case of that woman in Luke the 13th chap chapter, uh, Jesus pointed out in verse 16, uh, this woman being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound. You know, she's a covenant woman. She's a daughter of Abraham, but Satan's violated that covenant. And so we've got to destroy that. We've got to uh, do away with what Satan has done and release her so that she can enjoy her covenant provision, privileges, and blessings. So, you know, there is Satan who tries to do that. And there are several ways in which Satan tries to keep us uh, from enjoying a uh, new covenant provisions and blessings. And I'll just mention a few. You know, sometimes he tries to keep us in ignorance. He doesn't want us to know what's part of what God has promised for us and what God has given to us. Or sometimes he may cause us to forsake uh, our covenant, um, like it mentions in Deuteronomy 4 and 23. Uh, he, you know, he just says, okay, just, you know, he would divert us, distract us, uh, go cause us to go away from the covenant. Or sometimes he might seduce us. Daniel 11, 32 talks about that. Uh, he seduces us. Um, and takes us away, uh, deceives us, and takes us away from pursuing, walking in the covenant of God. Um, and the Bible also talks about those who dishonor, and that is it is very sad. People who willingly dishonor the blood of the covenant, uh, and they, they, they treat it as a common thing, and when they dishonor the covenant, obviously, uh, they're trapped by the enemy. They're no longer going to enjoy the blessings of the covenant. But this is the enemy's tactic. Uh, different ways in which he tries to keep people out of enjoying the blessings of the covenant. So we have to contend against Satan, against our own flesh, uh, and sometimes our own thinking, our own logic that keeps us from experiencing the covenant of God. So we have to press in, take it by force. Three simple things. Be established in the word of God. Walk in the light of God's word. Number two, exercise your faith. Be strong in your faith in what you believe. Uh, you know, uh, and, and say, God, this is what you promised for me, my family, my children, my home. This is the blessing of God. I want it. I will have it. And take it by force. Don't let the flesh or the devil keep you from enjoying your covenant blessings, the provisions and privileges that Almighty God has made available for you and me here on this earth to walk in. Of course, there are so many things. God's righteousness is ours. And we are in right standing with God as a covenant blessing. Many things that are ours as part of this covenant. You know, uh, we need to close right now. I know we've gone an uh, extended period of time here in this service, and uh, I'm, I want to take some time to pray and just minister to you uh, uh, through prayer. And if you will join your faith with me, uh, pray and believe God with me, uh, God will come through in your situation, in your life. Now, some of you watching, uh, uh, you may need healing in your body. Uh, as I pray right now, uh, uh, just as a sign of faith, as an act of faith, like the testimonies we heard today, uh, I want you to lay your hand on that part of your body that you want Jesus to heal. Or if I if I just put my hands like this and you want to touch your screen and just touch my hand, it's, it's as though, you know, when you, when you would come in a prayer line, I would have the opportunity to lay my hands on you. Uh, there's nothing magical about this, but it's just a point of contact and saying, yes, I am connecting with this uh, servant of God is praying and I'm just connecting uh, and I'm going to receive it. So it just, you know, if, if you came in a prayer line and you stood before me, I would lay hands on you to pray. Now I can't do that, but what I can do is as I put my hands out, you can touch the screen wherever you're watching your phone or your computer and just say, God, I receive. So if you want to do that, you're welcome to do it. If you want to lay your own ha hand on your own body, you can do that. If you're with other people, you can get other believers to lay hands on you. You can do that. Various ways in which God would, as a, you know, you you could minister healing. Uh, if you have uh, your son or daughter or your little children there, uh, you can have them lay hands on you or you can lay hands on them. Just do it. We're all believers. God will work through us. So we're going to pray for healing. But I also want to pray for people who are going through difficult situations and circumstances. You know, uh, 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 for some of us, of course, 
uh, uh, visas are a problem. Uh, people are stuck in various places. You know, you're not uh, prevented from being traveling. But I want to pray with you. Believe God that supernaturally God will intervene. Of course, we know government policies are there and uh, all those things are there. But let God intervene. And I don't know how we'll intervene, but let God intervene in those situations to come to your aid, to come to your assistance in the situation that you're facing. For those of you who are, who are having businesses and your business have, businesses ha, has been disrupted uh, in some way, uh, I want to join. I want you to join with me and believe God that He will bring a restoration of things. Now, there, of course, a lot of things that happen that are out of out of your control. But God is bigger than those situations. God can uh, cause supernatural increase. He can bring about supernatural multiplication. Take, for example, in Luke five, you know, Peter and the disciples. They spent whole night fishing. They caught nothing. Now that was, you know, maybe a good eight hours of work. Nothing happened. But they came out, uh, came back. They encountered Jesus. Uh, Jesus used Peter's boat to preach a sermon. Then he handed the boat back to Peter and he said, Peter, just launch out into the deep. Throw your net. And in that moment, what he did not experience in eight hours, in that maybe eight minutes, he experienced uh, a net breaking, boat sinking load of fish. He caught it. And you know, God turned everything around that day for Peter. And I believe God can do the same thing. Jesus can do the same thing for you and me in our situations. And he could step in and believe God uh, uh, and work miracles. And we just must believe God. So we're gonna take some time to pray, to do that. I want you to join your heart with me when we pray. I believe God for healings, for miracles, for deliverances. And if there's anyone watching and you've never given your life to Jesus, that's the greatest miracle that will take place inside you. You can be born again. You can have your sins forgiven. You, Jesus can become the Lord and Savior of your life. So while we are praying, you cry out in your own heart and say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a child of God. And that miracle of salvation will take place inside you. And that is the one most wonderful miracle any one of us can experience and we want you to have it. Let's pray together. I'm going to just pray in a very simple way, but we have a great big God who is there to meet you all right where you are. Let's join our hearts together as we pray. Father, uh, we just join our hearts together as we pray. People are watching, listening from various places at various times. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, let your healing power flow. Work miracles. Let miracles take place right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let bones be healed. Let nerves be healed. Let chemical imbalances come back to normal. Let organs be healed in the name of Jesus. Let uh, chemical levels in the blood come to normal in the name of Jesus. And I take authority over every demonic work in the name of Jesus. I destroy it by the authority of Jesus' name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Every spirit of infirmity, listen to me. I command you come out. Every spirit of insanity, every spirit of depression and oppression, confusion in the mind, every spirit that has captured the mind, I command you come out in the name of Jesus. Release the minds of people that people be set free. And Father, we pray especially for people in difficult situations, those who are held up in a certain places uh, because of uh, 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 the visa issue. Lord, I pray for divine intervention, a supernatural intervention in their situation. Let them know that God from heaven has intervened in their situation. We pray for businesses that have been disrupted. God, that you will supernaturally turn things around for their businesses so they will know that you are God who hears and answers prayer, that you will open the windows of heaven, pour out such blessing that they won't have room enough to receive it. So do these things and let there be testimonies that glorify your name and your name alone and we ask this in the matchless, mighty name of Jesus. And thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today on the service. You know, if God has done something for you right now, feel free to type it on the live chat and just let people know. Uh, we don't know how many are watching at the moment, but whether wherever they are, 
uh, let them know that something has happened to you. What we'd also like is if you can send us an email to testimony at apcwo.org. So emails that come to us with a testimony, those we are able to share with others. And we will, all, we will do it anonymously. We will not uh, reveal your personal details or other things like that. But just the, the fact that God has touched you or intervened in your situation, turned something around that as, you, as we pray. So share your testimony with us. And remember to share this video, this message, this service with as many people as you can. Send them the link, tell them to go to uh, youtube.com slash all people search Bangalore and let them benefit, let them be inspired, let them be touched through this uh, service that has taken place. So share it out with as many people as you can uh, and let them also be blessed. Next Sunday is Supernatural Sunday. It's a time and we're going to pray for healings and miracles. Uh, it will be a simple message that we will uh, share and that we'll pray specifically for people. So I want you to get people uh, uh, to tune in, uh, to listen to the service. Uh, I tell them it's a service that is meant to be prayed for healings, miracles and deliverances. That will happen next Sunday, the 26th of April. And after that, we're going to start a wonderful series on the mighty name of Jesus. And I'm really excited about that. Uh, uh, the subsequent Sunday, uh, uh, that's the first Sunday of uh, May, we're going to do a six-part, I think, uh, message on the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, and so we want to, I want you to just tell as many people as you can to tune into those services. We're going to uncover the richness, the magnificence, the power, and the greatness of the name of Jesus and just draw from all of that uh, and into our own lives. So tune in for those services through the month of May as we talk about the mighty name of Jesus. We're going to close with a benediction and we are so thankful to you for joining us today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us, continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. See you again.